Good evening, everybody. Tonight, I would like to talk to you about digitalization and sustainability and whether the smart society that we're currently constructing will also be a greener society. And I think the remarkable thing is that both issues, digitalization and sustainability, are considered very important by many people and at many levels today, but they're barely thought together. I and mean, we can ask ourselves in the room here, out there in the video stream, how often do you use your smartphone every day and ask yourself, how can I use this to make my life more sustainable? Probably not very often. But the same incoherence, you find it at the highest political level. Let's take the European Union as a prime example. The two overarching policy narratives at the EU level are the Green Deal on the one hand, to fight climate change and biodiversity loss, etc and the digital decade strategy on the other hand. But most of the policy initiatives that are currently developed are being taken place in complete isolation from each other. I think digitalization is not a, an end, it's a means to achieve something, to achieve common goals like social justice or environmental sustainability. So my key question for tonight is, does digitalization already contribute to making our society more sustainable or is it yet counterproductive and another problem posing it to sustainability? Okay, and I'll structure my talk into three parts. First, I will look at the impact of information communication technologies, the footprint. Second, I'll look into the potential of digitalization in making general consumption production more sustainable. And then thirdly, I'll talk about governance options because my key message tonight is that we need to be much more actively shaping the process of digitalization in order to make it really work for sustainability. And why this is the case and how we can do this, I'm going to show you right now. So first, let me go into the first part, the impact of information and communication technologies. Now, producing digital hardware, ICT hardware, is highly complex. There's up, uh, roughly two thirds of all the elements from the periodic, periodic table are involved in an average smartphone production. Some minerals are already scarce today, others are mined under dreadful labor conditions, again, others are extracted in ways that pollute the local environment, and there's even, unfortunately, some conflict minerals involved, which at times even perpetuate local wars. At the same time, ICT hardware production is among the very few sectors in the world that becomes more energy intensive every year, on average 4% per year. Most of the other industry sectors are becoming more energy efficient due to general technological progress, but ICT hardware has a growing footprint every year. Now let's look at the use phase when we're running the internet and all our devices. Then it's not possible without using electricity and the electricity consumption of the internet is quite considerable. Let's look at this table. We calculated that if the internet would be a country, it had the third largest electricity demand in the world, only after China and the United States of America. So roughly 10% of the global electricity consumption in the world stems from running the interconnected devices and producing the hardware. And the problem is that most of that electricity is not coming from solar bases so far, but it's fossil fuel energy. So that's why also the climate impact of digitalization is quite significant. Roughly 4% of the global CO2 emissions stem from the internet and from producing the hardware. So to conclude from my first part here is that Digitalization is not virtual or immaterial. It has a quite materialistic basis and it's far from being circular. It's not a circular economy. It's not like growing a smartphone. It's not like growing a carrot. You can either do that conventionally and then it's bad or you do it organically and then it's all good. No, the ICT hardware sector is far from being a circular economy. It's very linear. We're using, we're extracting the minerals and we're throwing the, away the devices at the end. There's not much recycling involved. And at the same time, it's not solar powered, but fossil powered. And that's why my first guiding principle for tonight is digital sufficiency. We do, should not think like as much digitalization as possible everywhere, but rather we should think as much digitalization as necessary to achieve certain goals, but as little 
digitalization as possible. And I think that should be a question particularly relevant for all those who construct smart cities or the Internet of Things or interconnected devices. We can always ask ourselves how much interconnectedness do we really need, for instance, to solve the great challenges of humanity. And for us, as users, Digital efficiency means use the hardware longer, try to repair it, don't buy new, practice data sufficiency, look at your data footprint, and also maybe at times, if you want, practice digital detox. Let's get into the second part now. Uh, the question, the potential of digitalization to spur sustainability transformations in the various sectors. And there is quite some potential here. So you could say, okay, the production of ICT hardware is not so sustainable at the moment, but maybe we can use all those devices and apply them in ways that cut down energy demand and resource demand and emissions in other sectors. And overall, we maybe achieve a positive balance. One of the potentials, how digitalization can contribute to sustainability is substituting physical goods by digital alternatives. I mean, the early examples are substituting printed media, books, newspapers or something by online news or ebooks or something like that. And you can save a lot of ink and paper and you don't have to cut down forests, etc. Think of more recent alternatives, like during the corona lockdowns, video conferencing that substituted physical travel by plane or car or even train has tremendously reduced global emissions, at least temporarily during the lockdowns. Okay, so substitution potential is one good thing how digitalization can contribute to sustainability. Another thing is digitalization eases the access to more sustainably manufactured products. Okay, so when you do online shopping, you don't have to race through your town and find a shop somewhere that maybe sells a t-shirt made out of organic cotton. No, you can just buy the organic t-shirt with the same easy mouse click as you can buy it the conventional one. Or maybe look at the production side a little bit. Once we have a digital product pass for every product and raw material, it will be so easy for companies to source raw materials or intermediate products from not from dirty sources anymore, but from sources that comply with social and environmental production standards. So another great potential of digitalization, but however, the share of sustainable products in the market is not much rising. Although we're already looking back at two or three de uh, decades of digitalization and consumption. Likewise, with the substitution potential, consequent substitution of physical goods and travel by digital alternatives is not the rule, but it's the exception, maybe at times of lockdown or so. What's the rule, what's the mainstream is that digital consumption comes add-on, on top of consumption of conventional predecessors. And these, I have two graphs that I'm going to show you to, tonight. The first one is uh, the comparison between television and video on demand. Hours watched on television, as you see up here, is not much declining, it's rather stable. But on top, we see steep increases on video of demand. So people still watch TV on, and, and on top, they do binge watching on Netflix. Okay, or same thing with um, shopping, e-commerce. There's not much decline in brick and mortar shopping in the stores. Actually, it's still increasing slightly. But on top, we see double digit annual growth rates in e-commerce, which comes in addition to the brick and mortar consumption. Now, the reason why we have this add on and growing demand is not a coincidence of digitalization. It's actually the very effect of digitalization. Why? Because digitalization makes consumption so much more efficient. We save time, we save money, we save effort when we do online shopping from home from the couch instead of driving to the mall. Okay, and these efficiency improvements by way of digitalization generate so-called rebound effects which increase demand. We use the save time, the saved money, the save effort in order to consume more, and this is exactly what our empirical data shows and what many other studies have also, have also found out, that the more people use online shopping options or even mobile shopping options, the higher their consumption levels. And that is why the net balance of digitalization is not very positive. What we see on the one hand is that we have this very materialistic basis of the ICT hardware production and the rebound and growth effects, and they weigh in more heavy than the substitution effects, 
more services, and then the efficiency potentials. So currently, we, we can state that digitalization does not contribute to solving any of the environmental challenges of our time. And that is why I come to my second guiding principle for tonight. We need a much more transformative policy agenda. We need to steer digitalization much more actively in order to really make it work for sustainability, in order to contain the rebound and growth effects, in order to unleash the potential for substituting and for easing access to more sustainable forms of production and consumption. And this is a huge endeavor because we don't have much knowledge so far on how to govern the process of digitalization. I'm trying to contribute a little bit to that endeavor defining that knowledge with the dialogue project that I'm currently hosting. I bring together a bunch of international renowned experts from various different countries in the world and from various different disciplinary and thematic backgrounds in order together over the course of two years, try to develop coherent, comprehensive, far-reaching policy proposals that make digitalization work for sustainability. And I'll share some insights with you here tonight. I will take two examples, the example of uh, transportation and again, the example of consumption. So if you look at the uh, transportation sector, if we leave digitalization up to the dominant actors in the market, which is the car industry or the automotive industry, what we see is that most of the research and development is poured into self-driving vehicles, or into driver assistance tools for luxury cars. However, these tools, these vehicles are super resource and data intensive. We've calculated that one self-driving vehicle may generate as much as 4,000 gigabyte of data per day, which would mean if we sum it up that only 1.5 million of those cars, is not a large number, only 1.5 million cars would generate the same amount of data as the entire world population generates today. So this is not sustainable, but more of the problem is that if all the research and development is poured into making cars better and more smooth and more attractive, then we impede the mobility transition away from cars and road traffic towards more low carbon alternatives. So what we need instead is massive support and investment in so-called multi-modality platforms. Multimodality platforms would make it easy for consumers to, let's say, they take a free-floating bike sharing to the next suburb station, commute into town by public mass transportation, then for the last mile, maybe they take a ride sharing or a scooter or something like that. And there are actually already a couple of these multimodality platforms out there. Communities are experimenting with them, but none of them has made it out of the niche so far because the venture capital goes to Uber or goes to uh, developing self-driving vehicles and not into the public platforms. So we need more support, more research, more governance to make them come out of the niche. And as well, we need to make those multimodality platforms also work for environmental issues because those that are out there, out there in the market, they show the cheapest or the fastest route, but they should also show and display the most environmentally friendly route, how people can get from A to B. Let me go to another sector. E-commerce, I'm coming back to this. So there's all these large shopping platforms like Amazon, but many others also, which gather tremendously precious data about all our consumption habits and desires, about which company sells what in the market, about market trends altogether. And with that data, these large platforms are perfectly equipped to even foresee the market trends of tomorrow. But what are they using this data for? They're mainly using this data to stimulate mass consumption. The main business cases in the internet, Google, Facebook, and others, depend on online marketing income in order to perfectionate online marketing and make the world consume more. But I think we all know we already have unsustainably high consumption levels. So what we need instead is massive development into rules and tools that bring more sustainable forms of consumption to the front. And I'm trying to do, uh, contribute to this endeavor a little bit with the project that I run together uh, right now with uh, Boyd University and with the green search engine Ecosia. And what we're trying to do is we're building up an partly artificial intelligence powered green consumption assistant, which helps consumers in the very moment when they search the web or try to shop online to find sustainable alternatives not only sustainability, uh, sustainably manufactured product, but also like sufficiency alternatives, like where can I repair my stuff? 
Where can I share goods and services? How can I maybe buy reused or rebuy stuff? And what we're doing is we're building up a green database to find the best of class products that we want to develop and, and um, uh, recommend. And then we're building browser extensions and a green shopping vertical so to, to make it most easy for consumers and to nudge consumers in the very moment of shopping towards more sustainable alternatives. What do others do? I think what's also very important when it comes to e-commerce is to support and much scale up so-called local commerce platforms. Okay, there's a lot of communities in the world out there, small cities, even villages at, par at times, who experiment with such local commerce platforms, which are supposed to be an alternative to the large, big uh, national or transnational uh, shopping platforms, and which try to bring the consumers of the community together with the local vendors, the local stores, you know, in order to decentralize consumption and production. However, many of those local commerce platforms don't make it out of the niche and do not run properly. So they, again, like with the multimodality platforms, they need more support and more research and development being poured into those platforms. But more important with regard to data is that we have to address the main competitive disadvantage of those small and distributed local commerce platforms. Because what they don't have is the access to big data and analyze all the market trends. So we need to develop public data pools, data governance and data analysis to make it work for the small vendors and for the local communities in order to achieve the best out of this big data analysis to drive consumption towards more sustainable alternatives. Okay, let me step back now and conclude slowly here. I think a lot of people these days ask themselves, how will the digital society of the future look like? maybe in 2030 or so. Okay, how will the digital society look like? And I guess a lot of people are tempted to think of new gadgets like wearables or so, or more artificial intelligence, or more virtual or augmented reality. I think what we need to achieve in the next 10 years in digitalization is not to advance technological development that much further, but rather to advance human and political control of that process. We do not need more gadgets, we need more regulation. We do not need that much more artificial intelligence, but we need a lot more human expertise and responsibility of applying these tools. And we do not need more disruption in the market, but we need to more capabilities of individuals and of politicians to redirect the process of digitalization and make it work as a driving force for sustainability. Another digitalization is possible. Let's make it together. Thank you so much. <laughs>